Hello, hello, welcome to Best Top 5. I'm your host as always, Best Guy. So today we're talking about top five documentaries about movies. There's a lot of documentaries out there about movies, but I made this list because as a movie buff, I sometimes like watching documentaries that go behind the scenes, that really go in depth into the whole idea about cinema. And this list is gonna go into those type of documentaries. At number five, we have The Video Nasties. So there's two documentaries about the video nasties. There was one that was made here in the US and there was one that was made in the UK. But both of them tackle the same subject about the video nasties. What are the video nasties? Hey, <laughs> good question. So video nasties in the 1980s was a, a rating that was classified to movies in the United Kingdom for films that were considered too graphic and too violent. Whenever you would go to a movie store or movie rental stores back in the day, you would find that you won't even have these movies on the shelf because they're classified as video nasties. So the government made a list of movies that were considered too obscene, too graphic for young viewers to see. The documentary goes in depth into what happened at the time. Back then, if you wanted to watch a movie like, I don't know, City of the Living Dead or Cannibal Holocaust, Cannibal Apocalypse, or any of these like brutally grotesque films, or even something as simple as like, uh, an alien ripoff like Alien Contamination, something really like cheesy but pretty violent for the time, you would have to actually get them from the US. The US uh, in the 1980s, what they would do is they would ship out a lot of these movies under a different label. It would say something like, oh, uh, Little Mermaid or something else in a reality inside you had a really graphic movie. In customs, they would find these movies and they would actually seize them and they would burn them. They would not have the audience to see these movies. But the thing is, when you prohibit something, you actually make people want to see it more. That's usually the effect. Nowadays, you can watch anything more violent on TV or even on YouTube. You can watch all these movies and, and compilations of people getting their heads cut off or whatever on YouTube. And it's all fake, obviously, these are movies. But the documentary does a good job, it's a two-parter. I think you can watch one of the parts on YouTube, but if you want to watch the whole thing, you actually have to buy the DVD. But it's really well done. They interview um, people who are in charge of censors at the time. They interview directors. Eli Roth appears in one of the, uh, the segments talking about the movies that he liked that were in the video nasties list. There's a bunch of these movies, and some of them you probably have seen by now. There's one called Eden Alive, which is a, 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 an alligator movie that was done by the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, Toby Hooper. And of course, by today's standards, even Texas Chainsaw Massacre was considered a video nasty at the time. All these films, by today's standards, they're actually, you know, very tame. And I don't even think um, the violence affects people at all, because that's what the whole idea was, that they believed that violence in movies um, affected people and to make uh, heinous crimes, which I think is very ludicrous. Like, even when I hear the whole thing about people playing violent video games and listening to obscene foul language and music, you know, I grew up watching a lot of these action movies and horror movies, and I turned out okay. I think- Some what, may say. Some may say. I'm a little wonky in areas and I'm a bit of a homo, but that's besides the point, you know, and I like Polly Shore, you know, nobody's perfect. So, but the thing is that at the time, they thought this way. What I do believe is that there are people that are more susceptible to being affected by media than others. If you're a completely normal kid who was raised, you know, and told, hey, look, what you're watching is completely fake. You know, you have a parent who tells you when you're a very kid, like, hey, this is all fake. You know, you should be completely fine. But there are people who are more susceptible, who have, you know, who are sick. And what can you do? So the documentary does a really good job. I definitely recommend it. It is number, number five on this list. So we're going on to number four. This is a funny documentary. I really enjoy this one. You can find this on Netflix. And this documentary is called Best Worst Movie. And this documentary goes on a hilarious road trip with the people who worked on the movie Troll 2. If you've never heard of Troll 2, then you have to watch it because it's, it's a sequel to Troll 1, but it's not really a sequel at all. Troll 1 was a fairy tale, kids kind of horrorish movie, not really, um, with uh, Julia Dreyfus, uh, and it has also other people that you've probably seen in other movies. 
It's it's very childish, but the sequel has no trolls in it, and it was directed by an Italian director known as Claudio Fragasso. And Fragasso in Italian, if you actually say in Spanish, it actually means fracaso, which in English translates to failure. Claudio failure. So Claudio Fragasso would go on to change his name to make other horror movies, but it didn't work. And Troll 2 is his masterpiece of shit. It's hilarious. They usually do movie nights for this movie, and they've done conventions where people go to meet the actors. The actor, the lead actor of this film, was actually a dentist who went to a lot of these conventions and found it weird that people liked the movie and thought it was funny. But it's very quotable. You have scenes where the lead actor, you think he's going to beat his son after he misbehaved, because um, there's a scene where they're all in a, in a dinner table and they're they're frozen in time and he wants to unfreeze the parents so he pisses on them and then they unfreeze and the, the dad grabs the kid and takes him to his room and he's about to take off his belt and you think he's gonna take off his belt but he says daddy what are you gonna do i'm just tightening my belt so i won't feel hunger pains and you don't piss on hospitality and you can't piss on hospitality i won't allow it what are you going to do to me, Daddy? Tighten my belt by one loop so I don't feel hunger pains. And your sister and mother will have to do likewise. Okay, Joshua, you want to get rough with me? You want to show me that you don't like the choice of this house for our vacation by going on a hunger strike? Well, I'll accept the challenge. But just remember, when I was your age, I really did suffer from hunger. We'll see who gets through this. But just remember, I've got more practice than you. I'll see you tomorrow. It's so stupid, but it's very... Something was lost in translation in that movie. Because Claudio himself, when he wrote it, he said that this was his magnum opus. Like this was his biggest horror movie that he could ever think of. And he went to some of these conventions and some of these premieres for a documentary and for the movie Troll 2. And whenever he would meet people, he would say, Oh, you like my film? You thought it was magnifico? He's like, yeah, it's pretty hilarious, man. And he was like, what do you mean hilarious? Like, unlike Tommy Wiseau, who was kind of like, owned it and say, you know, yeah, you know, it's not a good movie. And he goes on to say that it was all intentional from the, from the get-go, which it wasn't. With Claudio Fragasso, he doesn't admit it. He thinks he made a good horror movie. There's even a scene where he is, um, there's a girl, there's a guy who's really into this witch lady, and, and they're having a sex scene involving corn, and it's such a steamy, hot sex scene that the corn turns into popcorn. It's really, really dumb. And then you have the famous scene where the kid sees one of his friends getting eaten, and he goes, oh my god, they're eating her! Hey, me! Oh my god! They're eating her! And then they're going to eat me! Oh my god! But the documentary, what it does well is that it treats the movie as what it is a funny little film that was never intended to be funny and never really bad mouths the director it's all you know an accident and you know just like how the name is called Nigglebug Goblin Backwards I guess it's all an accident but anyway the movie uh, both the movie and documentary you should watch I recommend watching the documentary first so it can get you hyped up to watch the movie Troll 2 so number three, we have a documentary that came out a few years ago. It came out actually about 10 years ago, but it's still so relevant today. And the documentary is called This Film Is Not Yet Rated. And curiously enough, the documentary was so controversial that the MPAA rated it not rated. <laughs> this Film Is Not Yet Rated is a documentary that talks about the industry and how a lot of directors get their film with this big kiss of death of giving it the NC-17 rating. There's different ratings in the MPAA, and how it works is that a movie is submitted to the MPAA and a selective group of anonymous people watch the movie and then decide, and it's usually older people, older white males, who decide what this movie should be rated. Back in the day, the, the big guy uh, running it was this guy named Valenti, who was notorious for giving movies an R rating and an NC-17 rating when the movies weren't really that violent. But of course, it was kind of publicity. As you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And all these movies became famous for the ratings that they got. Perfect example is Showgirls, which was rated NC-17, and it's really tame by today's standards. It's just a lot of nudity and stuff that you can even watch on your typical uh, Friday night on TV. But the documentary interviews Goss Van Sant, it interviews a bunch of directors who've had their films butchered and edited for re-release 
because they were not intended to be direct released as NC-17 ratings. They were supposed to be intended to be released as R ratings with everything included. So what happens when the movie is rated NC-17? So NC-17 means that anyone below 17 cannot watch it unless they are with a parent or guardian. So how is that any different from an R rating? Typically in NC-17 movies, you don't really have that much more violence. You have a lot more sex and a lot more nudity, typically male nudity. In an R rating, you can have boobs, you can have vagina, but you can only have one dick show. You can only have a dick showing briefly, but that's it. Or you can show male buttocks, but you cannot show full-on nudity. Movies like Last Tangle in Paris got an NC-17 rating, um, Showgirls got an NC-17 rating, because you do see male nudity, and you see female nudity a little too much. And there's a lot of graphic rape scenes and sexual violence that, for the time, I guess, even, I've watched it today, and it's not a really good movie. It got notorious for that rating. And the directors go on to say that they hate the fact that they got this rating because once you get an NC-17 rating, the movie goes out to theaters and it only goes to about 300 theaters. Whereas with an R rating, it goes to every theater you can think of. So it's a kiss of death towards the director and the studio who's releasing that film. So well, they have no other choice than to trim it down. That's why you see a lot of movies today where the blood is CG because if it's actually physical blood, it's a lot harder to edit than you do if you have CGI blood. With CGI blood, you can just easily press a tool and remove the blood that's on the screen. When it's actually physical blood and really gory, it's a little harder. But you've had ex exceptions like movies directed by Steven Spielberg, like Saving Private Ryan, where all the blood in, in, in that movie was kept because it was actually factual to what happened in World War II during D-Day. So the directors in this film, some of them agree with the ratings, some of them don't. That's why I like the movie is not completely biased towards one point of view. It actually keeps it very uh, in check in terms of who you should trust in terms of the ratings. Should a movie be maintained in an NC-17 rating or should a movie be trimmed down to be released as an R rating? Does that affect the vision of the director or not? So I really recommend checking it out. That's why it's on this list. So number two, we have Electric Boogaloo. I like this documentary. This documentary talks about Canon. No, I'm not talking about the cameras. I am talking about a company that for a little while, for the 1980s, released a lot of schlocky action movies. Mostly movies starring Sylvester Stallone, Chuck Norris, Charles Bronson, and they're fun movies to watch. Now, whenever I see the logo for Canon and I hear that, I can't do the logo thing, but it's really, really cool. Whenever I see it, I'm like, we're getting a bomb ass movie right now. We're getting a shitty movie that we're gonna laugh and watch and we're gonna have a good time. Of course, back in the day, <laughs> Canon wasn't exactly very popular. They, were, they would get loans to make these movies for very low budget and they would churn up a lot of movies. They would release movies one after another and a lot of them were failures. They were, the, the guys who make the, the documentary, they did a good job in talking about what led to the failure because they release a lot of movies that are actually really watchable, but the two people in charge, um, Golan and Globus, who were, it was Yoran Globus and Menahim Golan, those two people, they, they were from Israel, they actually didn't like this documentary. They actually made their own documentary, um, which was also released around the same time to compete with Electric Boogaloo, and they tell their side of the story, and they actually have more interviews with people that work on their films, people like Sylvester Stallone. Whereas in Electric Boogaloo, you have people like Eli Roth and people who were more fans of it. And I prefer the Electric Boogaloo over the other documentary because it's more earnest and it's more true to what happened, whereas the other documentary, financed by Golden Globus, is actually trying to make themselves look like they're not, they're the good guys. When in fact, they did a lot of <laughs> sleazy stuff. Mainly the fact that they released movies, they would release posters without even knowing if they would have the actor. They would have posters with Stallone and Schwarzenegger, not knowing if they actually had them for that movie. There's even posters of uh, Dolph Lundgren in Masters of the Universe, even not knowing if they were going to have him for that film. They even did a fake trailer for Spider-Man in 1990s, which was never released. And that's crazy that uh, this uh, company went on for so long. Um, but they actually did some good movies. They did movies like Life, Life Force, and they have a movie called The Lombada. Um, so, it, there are movies to me, like, even the Death Wish movies, which they got more crazier and crazier of each sequel, where you had the original, which was done by Dino De Laurentiis, which is a, a vigilante dark film, the sequels got more dumber, like, the, sequ the sequel was also directed by Michael Winner, was financed by Canon, but was pretty much the same movie as the first one, but amped up. Then the third one, it's literally just 
Paul Kersey, played by Charles Bronson, eliminating a whole a whole town full of crazy crackheads. And then in part four, he's literally taking down the kingpin of, 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 of cocaine. It's berserk, but you it's, it's when you watch it from canon, you gotta enjoy it because it has cheesy soundtracks, the most ridiculous type of editing, and everything's done practical. This is before CGI was even a thing. So watch this documentary because you're gonna have a good time. It's short. I believe this used to be on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's on Netflix anymore, but they go and talk about all these movies. They even talk about the Hercules movie with Louis Ferrino where he punches a bear and the punch is so hard that he throws him out of space. Uh, it's so dumb, but I enjoy these movies. If you wanna have a good movie night, watch one of the movies from Canon and then watch the documentary so you can see how it's like to uh, have a, a full Canon experience. You have a company called Shout Factory who's releasing a lot of these Canon movies and they're doing a good job with the transfers, so good for them. They're getting a revival. I guess people didn't understand them when they first came out. So that's my number two. So, but what could be number one? It could, could top all these documentaries that I talked about that were really good in terms of talking about movies. I'm a big fan of horror and I love Freddy and I love Jason. And there used to be a documentary called His Name Was Jason, which talked about the Jason movies somewhat in depth. They have some interviews and it was pretty enjoyable, but two documentaries came out that were done by the same person and they're really long, but they're worth owning on DVD. I'm not sure if they are available on Blu-ray. I think they are both available on Blu-ray. And one of them is called Never Sleep Again and the other one's called Crystal Lake Memories. Both do extreme justice to the franchise. They have interviews with all the actors, with Tom Savini, with everyone who worked on these franchises and it's great to watch both of these back to back. So every time I watch these, I really get pumped to watch the Jason movies or the, or the, or the, Friday, uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies because when you watch the documentary, you get a sense of like how hard these people worked on these films. Even though most of them consider them sequel cash grabs, they did a great job with all these sequels. And the, the fact that they were able to get everyone who had worked on the previous films onto one documentary, I mean, they didn't get everyone, but they got a lot of great people talking about them. It's unheard of. And of course, it's really long, but it's definitely worth watching. I would say watch both of them because they're both made by the same person. Um, I got I got uh, one of them as a gift and I thought it was, it was gonna be just another documentary and I was surprised at how good all of it was. I really enjoyed it and um, I definitely recommend this. And that's why it's a number one, because if you like horror movies like Freddy and, 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 uh, and Jason, and you've never, if you've only seen like 15, 20 minute documentaries on YouTube, and you've never seen something fully dedicated to the fans, um, then you gotta see this because it's one of those documentaries that once you're done watching, you're like, wow, that someone understands me in terms of how I like horror. So it's horror made, the documentary made by people who like horror. It doesn't feel committee. It doesn't feel like something that was thrown together to make everything look like, oh, everyone had a great time. No, they put the good and the bad in one documentary. That's why they are on my top five list. So it's two movies for number one, but in reality, it's just one whole thing because it's talked about two franchises. So I hope you enjoy this top five list. I'm Best Guy. I'm criminally underrated and unwatched, but hey, that's okay. No one is perfect. Um, what can we do? So make sure to subscribe and hit that bell button. Uh, follow me on Instagram. I post there every now and then. Most of the time I'm lazy and I forget to post stuff. I hey, gotta be honest and earnest, but I will be posting a lot of stuff there. Not just stuff about here, but you know, all the things that I do on my daily life. Mostly just sit back and masturbate, but hey. So anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Click that like button, share this with all your fans, people who like movies, people who enjoy horror so they can see good documentaries that they're gonna enjoy. So anyway guys, also let me know on the uh, in the comment section below what are some documentaries about movies that I didn't get a chance to mention. I would like to see what are some of your favorites. Anyway guys, until next time, bye.